I still can't believe you ate your kids' Easter eggs. Have you finished them all yet? Yeah. <laughs> Way before Easter. <laughs> Did when, well, when I was a kid, I used to eat tiny, tiny bits and make them last for months and months and months. Have you never done that? No. Right. <laughs> now I don't. I just eat the whole thing in one bloody set. The Fuji cast. That's the way to eat Easter eggs now. Anyway, welcome to episode 10 of the Fuji cast. This week, thank you to our friends at Simpler Straps. We've still got them here. Look, the red one's still in the pack and we still haven't sent it, which we must do because yep. we promised, didn't we? I did. A couple I of weeks did. ago that we were going to send this to Patrick LaRock. Yeah, I'll get it to him. Yeah. Um, so the questions of the week, if your question is a question of the week, you get a free strap on us. Thank you very much. Your questions about anything Fuji film or photography related, technical, geek worthy, artistic, even personal, click at fujicast.co.uk is that address. There's our self indulgent minute. Uh, today's guest interview is Tom Stoddart, known for his work in the Serbian Bosnian War and his coverage of famine in Africa, the collapse of the Berlin Wall. In fact, the list is endless. His work is super. Superb. Today he lives in a quieter part of the world, Newcastle. But his, his advice for photographers, absolutely gold. So in the second half, we're going to be, be talking about getting in close, using shorter focal lengths and having the courage to work on, uh, you know, much, much closer to folks. So you actually don't use the 24, though, do you? You're, you're more uh, of a... I use a 23mm lens, which is... Sorry, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm talking in old equipment. language again. Sorry, yeah. you don't use the 16, you use the... No, I do actually, I do use, use the 35. 16 very occasionally. And I'm interested in getting my hands on the 16mm f2.8, the new Oh, the new one, yeah. Uh, I haven't, uh, I haven't seen it or, or, or had it at all yet. So um, I am quite interested to see where that happens. I'm, I may have to uh, dig deep into my pockets and purchase that soon. Is it expensive that one? I don't think so. I think it's one. It's one of the F two uh, weather sealed ranges, so they tend to be a bit cheaper um, than the than the big kind of metal right. lenses. So uh, I'm guessing it's probably around four hundred and fifty pounds, something okay. like that. But I don't know. You've been in Bristol doing a street course. I've never ever been to uh, not Bristol. Sorry, you've been in Brighton, Brighton, Brighton doing yeah. a street course. Yeah, I've never ever been to Brighton um, to 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 photograph um, when it's not been raining. Yeah, I was going to say that's not true because I was with you there last year. But yeah, then no, you no. caveated it with when it's not Th- raining. Three or four times now, I've either filmed or photographed in Brighton. Every single time it's been blowing a hooli and raining. Well, it was lovely. We were there last week. Uh, really, really nice. I love Brighton. They've done, you know, I mean, I remember going there back in the 80s and it was a little bit of a bit of a wreck. Um, but they've they've uh, they've really changed that city. Stand by for the comments on that Yeah, one. yeah. And, uh, well, Dear Mr. Mullins. Same, same thing happened to Cardiff. Same thing happened to Bristol. Uh, you know, they spent money on it. And, and now it's beautiful. I love it. I love the mm. lanes. I love uh, the seaside. I love they've actually got a vibrant shopping area there. There. We should one day. We should. Um, I don't know. I'm only just throwing this out. You. We should like to go away together. Yeah. To, to Brighton. Is that what you yeah, say? Yeah. <laughs> let's go for a nice weekend. No. We should do a um, a listener meetup somewhere. A listener meet. I see that. Yeah. That's very YouTubey. Bring your cameras. Yeah. We could go to Brighton. But wouldn't it be embarrassing when only us turn up? Ah. Well, no, well. Yeah. But <laughs> then we could just put the cameras down and go. That's I know this really good pint, little Irish bar. Yeah, actually. Yeah. 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 That's a really good idea. In fact, write to us if you'd like to do one of those. Yes. Because only when I've got a few people that say, say I'll yeah. turn up. And it has to be Brighton. <laughs> and it has to be Brighton. Because yeah, that's in my head now. Do you remember? We, um, of course you remember. We, we went to, uh, after the ex-weddings conference, mm-hmm. we took um, Facundo and Patrick down to Brighton. Mm-hmm. And uh, we went for fish and chips on the pier. We did. Yeah. They love that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> It's ace. I love it. I love Brighton. Quintessentially English. Very English. I'm, I met a photographer a couple of weeks ago called Chris Wardell, and uh, I do intend to make a, a longer podcast for my Breathe Pictures podcast. Plug, plug, plug. Um, but Chris um, has been around the, the entire uh, UK, and he's, um, he's made pictures of all the peers. Oh. He did it completely off his back. He wasn't paid to do it. In fact, this has cost him money. Um, he's sold about 100 books or something like that, so he's certainly not made the money back, although he's done talks and stuff like that. but he, he wasn't under any kind of peer pressure to do it? No. Oh, <laughs> you should do the first question. <laughs> okay, right, first You're question. still laughing at your own joke. <laughs> I chuckle away. Um, all right, my first question actually uh, isn't really a question. It's more of a comment that was on the website. And in fact, I'm going to give the my strap this week to right. you. Uh, God, you're playing the joker early. I'm going really early. Yeah. And actually, it, it all relates to when you had a, a wee next to Stuart Pierce. 
Do you remember? You said you had a Wheeznex. Yes, well, the fam- famous people you've had, you know, Wheeznex. Yeah, to. so this isn't a comment. It's more of a statement. And it was. it's just because I found it very impressive. And, <laughs> and uh, it's, Is that why you're giving your strap away? Yeah, it's Robin Chun, um, C-H-U-N. <laughs> and his comment is very simple. I once had a pint with Ian Hunter and Mick Ralphs, uh, of course, of Mott the Hoople. Play. Yeah. And that did it for me. I'm very impressed with that. So, uh, Robin, you are going to get your strap this week. Um, well done. My uh, financial advisor was called Ian Hunter. Ah. Mm. Not to do anything with that email, no. obviously. Well, I'm not giving him a strap. No. Okay, so, but on to a proper question. This question... Oh, just before you do the proper question, yeah, that uh, does play in. Dean, Dean Prater wrote uh, in as well. I'm a proud owner of two systems for my work, which I love. A couple of uh, XT2s, which go pretty much everywhere with me, although I'm still a Nikon, Nikon shooter too, and find the two systems complement each other well. You mentioned last week on the show famous people you've been stood next to in the gents. Thought I'd chip in on this one too, since I have a long list. These are These are cool. Brian Blessed. Oh. Can you imagine being sa- stood next to Brian Blessed? <laughs> <laughs> Gordon's alive! <laughs> it's my Brian Blessed impression. Uh, Paul Potts. Uh, Hugh Laurie. Paul that- Potts? Paul Potts. Paul Potts? Not, not Paul Potts. Oh. No, no. No, I mean, no, not the that's bad. terrible dictator. No. No, Paul Potts, the opera singer. Ah. Hugh Laurie. Oh. I mean, where's this guy work? Yeah. Or does he hang out in weird sort of... Oh, does think, he wait for these people to go to, to the gents? I think it's only fair... That's Hugh Laurie. I better go and stand next to him. You. Uh, it's only fair that you sent him a strap as well, I think. Well, yeah, the last <laughs> one is Anthony Hopkins. Oh, my word. Anthony Hopkins. Anthony Hopkins. I wouldn't like to be stood next to him with the gents. No, I'd no. like to have a nice Chianti, though. <laughs> he wouldn't be stood at the gents with the Chianti. Have you ever... Now, you see this at weddings. Sorry, we, we will come back to your question. Where people go into the loo with their pint mm-hmm. and they're at, the, at the, the wall. That's just disgusting, isn't it? Yeah. I'm a bit old-fashioned when it comes to stuff like that. Yeah, I, I kind of... I can understand it if you're in some kind of East End or, like, Newport nightclub and you put your pint down and it's gone kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but or worse still, somebody put something in it. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. That's yeah, a very yeah. good point. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, no, I don't think I would do that. No. Oh, okay. Anyway, look, I just thought I'd throw that one in. Yeah. The, the, the question. Um, I One day I'll talk about it when I met Kylie Minogue. Not in the gents. <laughs> no, not in the gents. <laughs> not that time. Uh, hi, Kevin and Neil. This is from Peter. Great work, guys, on the podcast. Now a favourite of the week. Thank you. Thank you. What do you both think of using two different cameras at the same time? Ooh. E.g. a Fujifilm X-H1 one alongside a Fujifilm X Pro 2, either both with Prime or one with Zoom and one with a Prime. I think it's absolutely fine. I regularly shoot nowadays X-T3 and X Pro 2. Um, I mostly used to shoot uh, dual X Pro 2s purely because the inside of the X Pro 2 is the same as an X-T2. Um, but now the X-T3 is out and it's better uh, functionality wise well how do you process those together then because the files are going to be slightly different they are they? slightly different different slightly different sensors um but i don't really take too much notice they're, they're pretty similar right. they're both x trans x trans three and four is only two megapixels different in sensor size it's very very i mean i've not noticed any particular difference in the old days when i used to shoot with uh, an x pro one and an xt2 mm. Now, they were different. They were The sensors were very different. So in Lightroom, I used to use smart collections to separate out the files from the different cameras. Um, now, back in those old days, the Fujifilm cameras never passed the serial number in the EXIF data. Right. So I had to do it with smart collections based on the file name that I would set in the camera. Okay. But now the serial number comes through. And also um, in smart collections, now you can look at the camera, make a model and all that kind of stuff. So I, separ- I used to separate them out that way. And I did used to edit them slightly differently. Okay. But not now. Um, and so to answer the question absolutely no problem whatsoever as long as you obviously know how to use both those cameras um, I would say the X-H1 is probably the most different out of the the Fujifilm cameras in terms of um, ergonomics menu structure and all that kind of stuff Mm. so you know whatever works difficulty difficulty really comes i think when you're really mixing flavors and you're working with say a canon or a sony and a fuji film camera that's that's now having um had a few um second i don't use second shooters very often but when i have rarely really does everybody use the same camera system as each other Mm -hmm. i mean i don't i don't choose them because they have a certain breed of, of camera no. but um but that that can that can cause problems because you know some some systems favor more you know heavier green 
Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I'm I'm assuming that uh, um, Peter's on about working by himself, you know, yeah. and so yeah. I mean, I don't I don't have any issue with that. Yeah. Uh, Riv Riv Kilokia, thank you very much for your question that you've sent to click at fujicast.co.uk. By the way, just send those questions in because we really are motoring around these questions. So they are the lifeblood of the show. I don't want to hog your feed. You feel free, Rivki. You hog. Uh, but I'm wondering if you can cover this topic in an upcoming podcast. I'm especially interested in hearing about adapting vintage lenses with GFX, which I've had the good fortune of purchasing primarily for personal work. So this will be portraits family snapshots and some nature now you've worked with some vintage lenses i know nothing about this this is i am throwing this rugby ball at you um with a vigor because because you've done that should uh, his question is quite long um because he loves the personality of vintage lenses Mm. um should he just adapt the lenses to the x bodies and reserve gfx only with native lenses uh which will take advantage of the resolution Uh, and there's lots of or 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 uh okay so yes i have a couple of i don't know how you qualify vintage in my mind vintage lenses are just manual focus lenses that are of a different manufacturer um however you know i I do have a couple of uh of old lenses that i do pop onto my gfx occasionally they are manual focus and um one of them is a Mm, my word i'm desperately trying to think of the brand now uh it's a minolta i think it's 85 mil f 1.8 lens um which is challenged to focus at 1.8 on a medium format system but the results are really nice they're not it's it's not like digital sharp it's nice and Mm. filmic if that's is, the right is, word. is there that much difference? Yeah. Oh, you can definitely notice. If you look at, uh, if you go over to uh, Jonas Rask's website, or Jonas, as he, he probably pronounced yeah. correctly, I'm Jonas Rask. While, I'm ta- while you're talking about this, I'm going to do that. Um, he's got a whole load of stuff on there, vintage lenses with all kinds of cameras, including all the feature film cameras and uh, Jeff X and all the other cameras. He's, he, I think he owns every camera in the world. Right. Uh, but Jonas Rask is the place to go for, to look for all of that stuff. Um, and, you know, he does really good way, or he does really good work in in terms of reviewing the lenses but also sharing a lot of his pictures and the, and they're amazing pictures of course because it's Jonas um, but yeah I mean I do use it and I I enjoy using them uh, it's not something I would probably use for uh, professional or commercial work maybe for some kind of portraiture if, they, if they, the, the case arose but certainly not for weddings too slow um, really when people go for those vintage lenses they're looking for the characteristic of those lenses they're looking for something that's now of course in the GFX range you actually have the um, Jonas Rask's work is beautiful isn't it yeah just looking at the website now yeah yeah, yeah Jonas Rask photography dot com yeah Jonas Rask photography dot com yeah and he saves lives as well Oh, he's, he's the doctor. He is the doctor. The doctor. Ding, so he's a ding, doctor ding, and a photographer. Yeah. Um, so anyway, but yeah, that, that's pretty much it. I mean, I uh, I think the GFX is made is is a perfect complement for those legacy lenses. You have the the crop um, factor, or thirty five mil factor in the in the um, camera itself now, which allows you to use different older lenses without worrying too much about the crop on the sensor, mm. um, which is only something you get in the GFX, uh, at least as far as I'm aware. And yeah, I mean, and and the good thing about those vintage lenses, I got my Minolta um, that one point eight lens. And it was something like I paid something like sixty eight pound on eBay for it. It was really cheap. Um, so you do good, need an good adapter. Deals on these, then. You need an adapter. Yeah. So you need an, a, a mount adapter for whatever lens you're going to use. But yeah, I mean, if you a lot of people I, I've noticed who are moving into the GFX system are buying the camera and not necessarily buying the GF lenses, but buying legacy lenses, right? Because it's it's a bit cheaper, of course, uh, and but allows you to get in there straight away and shoot. I noticed on the Jonas Rask website, by the way, I'm trying to find the vintage stuff and I haven't found it. So uh, the normal thing has happened that I've clicked around and straight away I found his 365. Hmm. Have you ever done a 365? Mm, well, if you can count 12 days of 365 as doing a 365, then yes. <laughs> but if you're counting 365 out of 365, then no. Yeah. Oh, you should see his 365. Hmm. Oh, great. I'm so jealous. Yeah. Barry Paffy. Now I'm giving my I'm I'm playing my joker early now and giving a strap for this one. Again, it's not a question. 
Um, I, I, I like this because it's support really for the photographic community. And I think that's really, really important. Um, the more of us that can support each other, the better. We're all in this one together, guys. We really are. So, Barry Paffy, thank you for this. Love listening to the podcast, guys. Particularly like the section. Um, uh, this must have been a particular one where Kevin said he's never proud of his work because um, oh, Barry says, I too suffer with that. Uh, perhaps you should elaborate on that. Well, that was a couple of episodes ago, wasn't there, where, where we were talking about just being hard on yourself. Yeah, we were, there was a question that came in about how do you get to the point where you're, you know, you're confident and proud of your work, mm. etc. And I think both of us agreed that proud is probably not the right word, but, you know, neither of us are, uh, you know, sit back and look at our work and go, hmm, yeah, that's brilliant. You know, we, we I think struggle. If you, if you get to that stage, yeah. it, it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a, a slippery slope, I think, to believing in yourself far yeah. too much yeah, for, yeah. for your own. Measure. Well, I think believing in yourself is important. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But um, I always come away from a wedding thinking I could have done better or I wish I'd done this or I wish I'd done that. It's something that has troubled me for years, so it's nice to hear I'm not the only one. Photography can be a very lonely profession, and listening to this type of thing shows that we're not alone. And I think that's, uh, the, the reason I wanted to give that this week um, was because um, I, I think that's more of a community thing, which I think which I think is important. So thank you, Barry. I think you're pointing something out that I think a lot of photographers feel and um, sometimes it's too easy to look at Instagram and look at, you know, the awesome lives that people are having and smashed think, it. you know, smashed, smashed it. Everybody smashed it. But I bet you when they get home, you know, they're the same as us. Some images they're really proud of and they think, yeah, I've done that. But other images they'll think, yeah, oh, maybe I could have done slightly better on that one. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to put you in the put you in the pile for a strap to be sent to you. Yep. One more question, Kev. Then we'll go for our guest. Okay, so this is a question from. Oscar Laverde. Hi, guys. First, I want to say uh, your first podcast was well presented and remarkably interesting. <laughs> Thank you for that. I have a question for you guys. Good I, job. I am from Canada and would like to hear from your perspective, i.e. the UK, the difference between wedding photography in North America in general, US and Canada, and the UK or Europe. Any criticism or anything we could learn from both sides of the pond? So before we dig into that, I only found out last week that Canada is the second biggest country on the planet. No way. Mm -hmm. Is it? Canada, if you look on the map, Canada is huge. It's like something like three times bigger than North America. I have no idea. Obviously with a lot less people. Yeah. Uh, I think it's something like there's the same amount of people living in Chicago as living in the whole of Canada, but Canada is absolutely massive. I've never been to Canada and I really want to go. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I like Canada. Um, okay, so uh, do you want to do you want to take on that a little bit first in terms of North America and the differences between uh, us and them? Well, you know, we talked last week, funnily enough, about the mm. fact that America have uh, seemingly less documentary photographers at work. And I think Canada's the same, isn't it? Wedding. Wedding. Oh, yeah. yes, in terms of wedding. Mm. Sorry. Um, uh, although you did make the point those that do exist are the, the, the top of the tree ones. And the, but it's just not a style that... that American photographers in terms of weddings have have gotten into I, I think partly, as much. I think this part. Imagine, consider, if you will, you live in uh, the out, uh, the, 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 the you know the, the wilderness of Canada, right. and uh, with you, only a moose as your neighbour, only a moose and uh, the, and the Rockies, yeah. and you decide to get married. Would you? Would you not want to have the beautiful Rockies and the moose oh, God, as your yeah. background? And, yeah. you know, I think there's an element of I'm not saying that we don't have beautiful landscape and countryside here. Of course we do. Mm. Um, but I do think there's an element of where you're from and the geography of where you're from has dictated to a certain extent the style of photography that's grown up around it wedding wise. Yeah. Um, so if you're in California, if you're on Malibu Beach, you're likely to struggle to get kind of documentary style photography, wedding photography, because people want that that vibe they want that feel and that that can only be really orchestrated um you know less so in places like new york perhaps where you know weddings are likely to be more inside hotels that are just inside and you know and so the documentary yeah, approach yeah. might work better there um certainly canada you know and and uh, you know that's that's my kind of feel about why. Well, certainly beach weddings. I mean, it's a totally different kind beach, of experience. Beach, mountains, lakes, sky, uh, snow. And if, and if you photograph a, a wedding in, and we, you always mention Swindon Registry Office, 
um, it's going to be a, a much grittier, earthy feel, isn't it? I mean, you're, you're going to get... Gonna it's almost like social documentary photography mm. rather than this beautiful vista. Even I mean, vista can be documentary, but totally different background. Yeah, and I'm not saying that, the, you know, that people who get married in these places won't want documentary-style photography, but this is... The question is about the differences in general between, um, like, geographically the differences that's affected wedding photography and I, I think that has to be it I think it has to be about the the place mm. um, because you know there are so many people in America and they are a very artistic nature nation and Canada of course North America um, and they they must have an appreciation there must be enough people out there to have an appreciation mm. for documentary style wedding photography not of course that having formal photography is a negative thing at all either as we just said that you know if you're in a place like that then it made sense um but i think that's why it's probably a little bit more difficult to to kind of pick up these types of clients uh you know it's the same in spain actually spain um you know you kind of you get more northern more northern spain madrid that kind of area documentary style wedding photography is getting more popular you hit the south, no chance. You know, it just just doesn't happen, and that's partly because of the uh, the culture, but also because of the weather and the environment and the landscape. And then there are photographers that break the mold, aren't there? Mm-hmm. What about Facundo Santana? Facundo. Facundo. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, he uh, his his uh, documentary approach to weddings very different to a lot of his colleagues and, and peers. That that um, it's it's very formal um, style of photography in his part of the world, mm. but not for Facu. No. Yeah. Not for Facu. No. Uh, absolutely. And, and you know, Argentina is a very religious country. Um, so there's a lot of um, elements of that that come into play. Yeah. So, you know, you have, uh, I remember having a conversation a while back with a, uh, an Indian groom. And um, he said, you know, we really want you to, to do the, the weddings, but we, you know, we must have the 65 pictures on the mundap yeah, yeah, of the, yeah, of yeah. the uh, family giving the gifts to the bride and groom, which is fine. Um, and I said, yeah, OK, you know, we, we can deal with that. We'll either get a second shooter in or you can go away and decide what you decide to do. Yeah, yeah. In the end, he didn't book. Um, however, and I got talking to him about this and he said, um, yeah, you know, it's it's. And I said, why why is this a thing, by the way? Why, why do you have to have a picture of the gifts being handed over? And he said, oh, it's cultural. It goes back generations and ge- hundreds and hundreds of years. And I was like, well, you know, the- photography's only really been around about 125 years or so. It can't go back that far. And he was like, oh, yeah, I never really thought about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I, I totally understand in the Asian world, you know, the, the, being seen to give the gifts. That's, yes. that's, the, that, 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 that's what they want captured. But, the, you know, he was kind of like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. You know, it's not true that my great grandparents were having the gifts photographed. You know, <laughs> I, I I think um, that, that photographing sometimes the formality can be a, a fun part of the documentary as well. Mm-hmm. Going, but we mentioned it last week. Um, going back to the Turkish weddings that I shoot, yeah, um, they have. Um, uh, they, 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 all the ones I've done, have, they've they've never veered off this path. That they've turned up. Um, all the key members of the of the wedding party have turned up to a studio. So it's not even outside. This isn't even done outside. It's done usually against a grey backdrop with some um, some pillars and some um, some props that they bring in, mm. and they photograph all the family having very formal documentaries uh-huh. against the grey uh-huh. grey backdrop. And I, when when this was said, the bride and groom said to me, "Well, you'll probably want to go off during those moments. Maybe go and get some lunch." I said, "No, these will be fabulous uh, moments." Shoot around because it. photographing everybody looking absolutely miserable in between these shots, thinking, "How much longer is this going on?" <laughs> I, I found was par for the course of showing the the story of the day so Mm -hmm. thank you for your questions Uh, click at fujicast.co.uk click at fujicast.co.uk is our address Uh, we've cleared down an awful lot of emails of late so um, start sending them in again because they'll be on the show this week's guest is Tom Stoddart uh, Tom is a photojournalist. I met him. Um, really, I was introduced to him by by a, a, a friend of mine who shoots, um, who used to shoot conflict, and uh, he said you must go and talk to Tom. Um, number one, he's probably mo- one of the most generous photographers out there in terms of giving his time to other photographers. And number two, his back catalogue of work is just just stunning. We've mentioned him a couple of times on this show. Um, I say I say stunning because a lot of the stuff he shoots isn't isn't um, it's not not particularly 
um, pretty in terms of its subject matter. Oh. But um, his his composition, the way he shoots, the thought that that goes into his composition, it's the story, it's the, the story. story making that. Um, and he he's forward in his la- one of his latest books, Eyewitness, was written by Bob Geldof hmm. um, because of the um, just the the honest nature of Tom's work. So um, this is um, an excerpt. You can hear the full podcast um, with more of, of the interview with Tom on my Breathe Pictures podcast. But this is an excerpt uh, and a chance to to meet Tom Stoddart, the man behind the pictures. I think when you start, it's uh, it, you know it's incredibly exciting. You're um, I remember going to Beirut in 1982, and I first met Don McCullen there in Beirut, and it was a, it was the biggest story in the world, and the uh, Israeli forces were bombing Yasser Arafat's uh, PLO, and you know you really felt this was what being a real photographer was, um, that you were on a, a major international story, and there were very few photographers, and it was dangerous, so it was incredibly exciting, and you felt you know that your work was worthwhile. Um, and I've always felt that that uh, I, I, I've always felt um, that I have the right to be there as a photojournalist in in lots of situations. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a policeman. I'm not a soldier. I'm a photographer. And um, and when I go into areas like that, I do my job. Um, of course, if if you have the chance to, if you have to get involved, then you do. You're a human being first and a, and a photographer second. But by and large, uh, your role is to to go into these areas where other people can't. They they don't have the uh, the privilege of, of of going to see these things firsthand. So it's your job to bring back images that are truthful and are educational and that uh, inform and inform debate and maybe get things changed. That's all you can hope for. How does making imagery in these these bleak places or during bleak times, how does that affect your humanity? Well, there are many things that you, you look at and you think, how could anyone do this? I mean, Lockerbie was, is one thing that, uh, how could anyone callously plant a bomb on an aircraft and and, um, and bring it tumbling out of the sky? Um, my job... You know, on that on that evening, I was there quite quite quickly because I happened to be in the north of England when it happened, and um, I got there quite quickly. Uh, you know, it's it's a it's just purely a, um, a record. Uh, it's a very historic event, and uh, needs to be documented, recorded uh, for for history. And um, you know, you do the best you can in in what was a horrific scene. I'm 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 a photojournalist. I tell stories with my camera just like um, colleagues of mine tell stories uh, with their pen or radio uh, reporters do it with their microphone or, you know. I choose to tell uh, stories with a camera um, and with as few words as possible. I want people to look at my pictures and understand what's going on with the, with the photograph and just a short caption. Um, documentary, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what... Uh, you know, obviously the word means to document uh, what's around you, um, but it, I don't see much of a difference really between photojournalism and, and, and documentary. At these times, are you a, a photographer or a participant? Can you be a, a humanitarian? I think you're all of those things. You're all, you are a photographer, you are a participant, and you are a uh, humanitarian. You, By the very nature of picking up a camera and pointing at someone, you change um, you change, they change their expression, they change uh, the way they are. <laughs> There's an argument for saying that paparazzi, long lens paparazzi, is the purest form of photography and it's the most reviled. Because if you're hiding in a bush and you, you are photographing someone on a 600mm lens, then they're not, if they're not aware of you, they're completely natural. So there's, there's lots of arguments um, about things like that. You are a participant because you're there. Um, hopefully, a participant for good. Um, you know your picture should be um, should be used to change things. Um, if if it's a negative situation, I mean, still pictures are incredibly powerful. Still, incredibly powerful things. If you think of the pictures from Abu Ghraib uh, torture. Uh, uh, prison. Darby turned in the pictures of prisoner abuse at Abu Ghraib in Iraq. 
pictures he'd discovered purely by accident. Low-ranking soldiers like Lindy England committed the abuses, but the Senate Armed Services Committee today released a paper... You know, what other stills would... Uh, what other kind of medium would get Don Donald Rumsfeld to go on television and admit that the United States were doing this and apologize for it? I feel terrible about what happened to these Iraqi detainees. They're human beings. They were in U.S. custody. Our country had an obligation to treat them right. We didn't, and that was wrong. So to those Iraqis who were mistreated by members of the U.S. Armed Forces, I offer my deepest apology. If the stills didn't exist... Um, you know, there's no way he would have done that. But they do exist, and they were taken by people on the inside, by their very own people who are administrating these beatings. Um, and that's what's changed. The, um, the authorities can't stop people like me um, getting into, uh, you know, sensitive situations as they see it. But, um, you know, the uh, they can't stop their own people uh, in this this kind of age of selfies and, and documentation of your of your, what you do as a person. So it, the danger for the authorities is going to come from the inside. And that's why we've gone back to World War I, where eventually the, um, the military banned uh, soldiers from carrying cameras in the trenches. Uh, the military now frown on, on soldiers taking photographs. Um, you know, um, and that's, that's, that's how it is. But... The still photograph is still incredibly uh, powerful. Is it right that a lot of photographic projects are self-funded? If you want to make a story that you feel really passionate about, you have to take that initial financial risk. A lot of the projects now are self-funded. The magazines uh, don't have the budgets to, uh, or the will to send you uh, on on uh, news events, international news events. Covering news is very expensive for magazines. And, you know, the truth is that they're more interested in royal stories, celebrity stories, uh, sports stories, than they are in, you know, what's going on in Libya or Iraq. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be covering these areas of the world and these, um, these stories. Part of our remit as photojournalists are, are, is to remind people that, you know, not everyone has access to electricity, not everyone has access to medicine, clean water, um, human rights. So if you're going to do this job seriously, you have to be aware that you might go halfway around the world and shoot for a period of time and, and come back and hardly anyone will be interested in the photographs. You, you always have to remind yourself that this is a, 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 it's an amazing way to earn your living and, and uh, you're literally the jack of all trades and, and you see a lot of things, but you're there for a short, a short time. So you can't possibly become an expert on everything. Um, but you have to remain interested and, and you have to be interested in people and um, what makes the world tick. And it, if, you're, if you're interested in news and current affairs, it's, it's an amazing uh, job. It's addictive, isn't it? Very much addictive. Again, uh, on my first job uh, as this kid on a paper, the, one of the old photographers said, you'll have a, a champagne lifestyle on a beer salary. And uh, that's exactly what it's been. Let's talk about your, your legacy and the fact that when you're making some of these pictures, the Berlin Wall's a, a good example. Are you aware how important your images, your pictures are going to be? I don't think uh, you're aware at the time. Um, I, I'm a great kind of believer that, uh, and I, I tell young photographers this all the time, that they're not shooting for the next day or the next week or the next month they're shooting for the next 20 years 25 years especially if they're on a on a, an important event um as i said i've been around this is my 46th year as a professional and it's amazing how many times photographs i shot 20 years ago 25 years ago i mean the berlin wall is, is a point in case i happened to be by by chance by luck on on the berlin wall the night it opened i was at checkpoint charlie when the very first people came through um, and it seems like yesterday and in fact it's you know it was November the 9th 1989 and uh, the pictures I shot that night are still being used uh, regularly when do you stop you never stop why would you stop you know Ever? I don't see the point of stopping and uh, <laughs> something that slightly irks me is that every new award every new bursary is for photographers under 30 and you know there's all this help given to um, uh, young guys 
um, because they, it seems like their ideas are better than than an old guy, and um, I I really don't see that. And I, I you know, I take um, lessons from people like Ellie Derwitt and uh, who are still shooting well into their 80s. Um, I think ideas are uh, are the currency of how we how we exist as professional photographers because. I mean that and the the insatiable quest for news and needing to know what's going on anywhere in the world at, at any given time is um, is crucial really to being a photojournalist. Thank you to Tom Stoddart for his time um, in Newcastle where this interview was recorded. And if you'd like to hear the the full edition of that, then you can go to. Um, Breathe Pictures, my uh, my website, breathepictures.com, where the Breathe Pictures podcast presides. And actually, there is a film uh, on YouTube that I made about him as well. So maybe we could put those links mm-hmm. in, here, in, the, mm-hmm. in the show notes. Amazing film. Something we, oh, thank you. Something we haven't done for a long time is look at a book. Mm. Um, and you brought the, the, the home book in. Well, um, I brought it because I, I recently got the new Alex Soft book, um, which is uh, just literally landed on my doorstep a couple of days ago. New one, yeah, the new one. Um, I, I can't remember what it's called. Now. It's something like um, "I, you know, when my heart is furiously beating." Okay, something along those lines. Um, and I was going to bring that today, but but then actually I realised that we both have um, some Alex Soft stuff in this home book you yeah. have the book or yeah. I, ha- I have the book and it's more Fujifilm related really because it's the uh, the exhibition that Magnum and Fujifilm put together called Home and they selected a handful of the Magnum photographers to shoot with the G- uh, GFX yeah GFX. Well, no, I don't think they had to. I did. No, they did. Yes, I you're think right. it's GFX. Yes, 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 yes. Um, so there's I don't know, fifteen of the um, ex photographers. Good lord, mm-hmm. of the Magnum photo- photographers, and uh, all of their pictures are in here. And I think they were t- tasked with producing something like twenty pictures. Um, and it's a really beautiful, well put together book. And the exhibition was excellent. And you, uh, you were doing some behind the film, uh, behind the scenes documentary of that as well, weren't you? Yeah, I I covered um, Mark Power. Mm-hmm. And uh, Olivia Arthur. Mm. Now Olivia's stuff in this book, I think, is breathtaking. Well, Olivia was in the middle. Uh, well, she was she was just about to have her her second child. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I interviewed her when she was, um, I, th- I think, just a couple of weeks to yeah. to go. I yeah. think because by the time the um, the actual do came round, she she had had the baby, and, and and but the the pictures in here of um, Olivia Arthur um, going through. Mm. The final weeks of uh, of pregnancy, she was preparing for another little one to come in the world and yeah. dealing with. I mean, there were very honest pictures of how her daughter was dealing with that at the time. Yeah, uh, and actually, you know, I, I I think it's it's fair to say that all of the photographers in this book are you know are, are amazing and world class and rightly so. But I think there are some elements of this book that stand out stronger than others for me personally, at least. Uh, I love Elliot Erwitt's um, contribution to it. I was just about about to mention Elliot Erwitt. <laughs> the, everybody was in the Elliot Erwitt, but I mean, they look around the whole exhibition. Yeah, but then they tended to end up at Elliot yeah, Erwitt's yeah. section. Brilliant. I mean, a lot of them are kind of self-portraits, him set in front of the TV and stuff, you know. I've always loved that one with the, with the fish head with a cigar in its mouth. Yeah, yeah um, it's amazing. I mean, it's it's such a cool book. And, and uh, I'm fairly sure you can purchase it on Amazon and various other places. Certainly, you'd be able to get it from the Magnum website, yeah. possibly even from the Fujifilm store. I'm not sure about that. Um, but it's a really, really lovely book to have. And and the key thing about it for me is, you know, I, I'm a collector of photo books, but I'm, I am I also I buy them because I want to look at them as well, not yeah. just because I want them to, to go up in value. Uh, and, uh, you know, this book is something that I look at and I actually think, you know what, I, I'm... I, I I haven't I haven't taken pictures of the kids for the last couple. You know, just having tea tonight or having dinner or yes. you know whatever. It just makes me want to grab my camera. Do you, do you have your camera? Uh, I know you haven't of late by the sound of it, but usually do you have your? It's X one hundred you carry around most of the time. Isn't oh, it? there's a camera everywhere in the house. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's always a camera in the kitchen and stuff. Uh, it's usually the X one hundred. But say, I mean, you've got some uh, glorious pictures of Albie having real tantrums here and there. Yeah, is that when you normally think I need to get a picture? Of yeah. This? yeah, I mean, bless yeah. Albie. Sorry, Albie, if you're listening to this in fifteen years time thinking, <laughs> how dare you, dare you? No, I mean they're growing up now you know it's a 
the same with your kids. It's uh, things are changing. The, the dynamic of cha- of taking those those pictures at home are yeah, are, yeah. Da- are changing. Yeah. I mean, Rosa Rosa's she goes to high school in a few months, and I know. Same with our Jack. They're oh, same age, aren't they? My yeah. word, it's it's just. Well, it's heartbreaking, frankly. But, you know, <laughs> other than that, it's just different. Everything is different. It's part of growing. Actually, that, that plays right back to the Mark Power story. So mm. if you look in the home book, um, then, uh, and we will have links to this, uh, Mark was preparing for his daughter, Chili to uh, leave home and go to university. So it was quite, a, you know, the, 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 the feeling in the house when I went in to film this, by the way, with an X-T3, an no, XT2, XT2 at the time. Yeah, um, yeah, because it was like it, yeah, it was XT2. So Eighteen was, months. Ago. Yeah, um, was palpable. You could feel this sort of nervousness about Chile leaving. I um, I made a, a YouTube film and um, about the about the exhibition, uh, the the making of the exhibition. And there's some bits in there. In fact, the the Magnum film as well, which is on my YouTube channel. Um, has um, I, I, I've put a link in there to the Mark Power film where you can see mm-hmm. those feelings and those pictures he was making as um, as his daughter was preparing to. I, I love to that leave home. that Mark Power documentary because it 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 just everything crystallizes and you see these um, you know people class them as world famous photographers and stuff like that and and actually underneath all of that it's just a person. You know, I found that when I was spending some personal time with Mark, mm. um, that he was. I thought, well, okay. So I've, I've always revered his work, mm. love his work. A friend of ours, Alistair Freeman, mm. um, talks about the um, what was it called, the shipping forecast? Yes, as one of the seminals that were, for him, one of the most important pieces of work yeah. that, that Alistair um references when he talks about getting into photography and that was yeah. mark power's work yeah and um, spending time though with him i thought it's going to be this this superstar photographer what on earth am i going to have in common was just not true no and and it's very similar to, to spending time with tom stoddart uh-huh. just not true and i've met tom a couple of times you also know, and really kind really generous with his time uh, absolutely happy to talk yeah very happy to share yeah to give advice when asked to give advice but but you know yeah lovely people Indeed. So go uh, go look for the home book. A um, couple more questions, then I think we'll go for our, our topic. Um, Petra Bright, I have not long set up a portrait business photographing kids mainly. I've been using a Canon 5D Mark II, which I love, but I want to try and work with a smaller system. Would the focusing be fast enough in your experience and opinion for photographing fast-moving kids? I'm assuming you're talking about Fujifilm cameras. You didn't say that, but, um, well, what do you think, Kev? Uh, yeah, because you've just been talking about <laughs> photographing your children. Yeah, so. <laughs> I think I, I, yes, I think regardless whether it's future film, Sony, whatever. I think that these days, at least, they are fast enough. Mm-hmm. Um, perhaps right back in the day when the X Pro One came out, X One Hundred, the original one, you know, definitely was not up to up to the same focusing speed as the DSLR equivalents then. But now, I mean, XC Three, my word. Well, I'm going to be a little bit controversial uh, in that um, are there moments I think I miss with the X-T3 above my 5D4. And I think if I haven't got the camera, if I haven't given it a little uh, depress on the shutter as I bring it up to my eye, there's a chance, there's just a chance in that split second, I, I you know, it's not quite you, quick enough. Do you have your high performance mode switched on? I don't. And that's my, yeah, there you go, I've then. got to switch it on because I've thought too much about mode, battery life. Power settings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good point. No, I don't. <gasps> Although I've always been thinking about battery life and and this thing and the and you know this thing that Fujifilm was always berated for was oh the batteries are rubbish they'll just run out quicker than anything you'll never have enough battery life over and I don't find that now <laughs> because I'm no. in power saving mode yeah. I find it fantastic I don't change the batteries uh, as much as I thought I would uh, at I, all I shot a wedding on Saturday and. I shot two. I shot X Pro to an XT3, um, a usual full wedding coverage. So I probably took eighteen hundred, two thousand pictures, yep. maybe even more. Yep. Uh, I changed the XT3. You you're, not, you're not shooting through this thing at twenty five thousand frames. <laughs> what? I, sh- I changed the, I changed the XT3 battery once yeah. uh, just before the first dance, and the X Pro two was just one. So I didn't go through any more batteries than that. I do take more batteries with me though. Another question, Kev. Then we'll go for our topic of the week. Okie doke. So this question is from Oscar, and he says, Hi guys, really glad you started the podcast. Your work is very inspiring, especially Neil's. 
<laughs> Breathe series and the interview with yeah, Tom Stoddart. I was say, yeah, <laughs> finish that sentence. <laughs> uh, my question is related to the electronic shutter on the Fujifilm cameras. I own the X-Pro2 and X-T2. Yep. I love the idea of the electronic shutter, but I'm finding it, I'm not quite getting it right. I'm getting banned in rolling shutter. Do you guys ever use it? And if so, uh, is there a rule of thumb to go by so I won't be getting banned in? Shutter speed, fluorescent lighting, fast moving subject, etc. Mm. PS, bonus question for Kevin. How is he finding the X-T3 and does his X-Pro2s sit at home now? Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give my little two pennants on that. Mm-hmm. Um, X-T3 is an amazing camera. Uh, my X-Pro2 still does come with me to a wedding, so I'm generally shooting with one X-T3 and one X-Pro2 right now. Um, so that answers the, the bonus question. Now, the electronic shutter stuff... Um, Funny enough, when you if you did ever upgrade to the XT3, you would notice that's much better um, yeah. in terms of the banding. Banding without a, without a doubt. Yeah, banding is a thing. Um, the rolling shutter, as they as they call it, essentially depending on where you are in the world, you'll see different frequencies of light. Um, and I think in the UK it's the 50, fifty hertz. Fifty hertz yeah. in the US it's sixty hertz. So you always know if you're you're filming something in the background, you've got some lights that aren't. <laughs> that, yeah, that you'll aren't, see them aren't, flickering. Aren't up to spec. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And so you can mitigate it to a certain extent by trying to shoot at multiples of that frequency. So if you're in the UK, uh, shoot at uh, 100, uh, 50th of a second, 100th of a second, 150th, etc. That might mitigate it, certainly will with uh, the uh, mechanical shutter. But the, the fact is the electronic shutter will struggle in very, very bad lighting condition. Mm-hmm. And it's just one of the things, the way that the technology is, is evolving that way. Um, there's this, uh, the, the fabled global shutter that people seem to talk about and I have no idea what that actually means but apparently that's the thing that will solve all of this and allow us to shoot at many hundreds of thousands of a second and not have to worry about um, banding and shutter speeds and the global various shutter. stuff yeah that's what they keep calling it um, I don't know what it means though technically so uh, yeah so uh, you're not actually technically doing anything wrong um, just use it where applicable I mean I have my cameras always now set to uh, shutter type mechanical and electronic, so it will automatically kick into the electronic shutter if yeah. I can't get the shutter speed I need if I'm shooting at fast apertures. And I know. I, do you know? We, we I'm surprised we've not had questions on that. Why? Um, why does it have both? And that's the reason why, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it has. Uh, so you can either choose mechanical electronic or mechanical and electronic where that decision is made for you by yeah, the camera yeah absolutely so if you're shooting at f1.4 and you're in bright sunshine but you still want to use depth of field yes you still want to make the most of that that environment then you're going to have to increase the shutter speed or yeah. make it faster i should yeah. say um so you can shoot up to one thirty two thousandth of a second then with an electronic shutter and of course it's 100 percent silent mm. so one of the things that i do when i go to it favors a, mechanical though doesn't it, it Over favors mechanical yeah. Yeah. yeah so one of the things i do when i go to a church is I will, um, you know, I'll, I'll go to where I'm likely to be standing and I'll use the electronic shutter and, and take a fast burst, rapid burst. Yeah. And then you can see on the LCD of the if there's any banding. So if there's any banding on the LCD as you're, as you're um, previewing back through those images... What a good tip. You'll, you'll see it and then you yeah. decide not to use it. If yeah, I don't yeah. see any banding, which with the X-T3 I rarely do these days, then I'll always use the electronic shutter. I'll use the mechanical shutter for the bride coming down the aisle yeah. um, just because of you know, want to make sure that, that, that I'm getting that, and actually, the um, the listening to the shutter going mm. is gives me a little bit of confidence that it's worked. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'll switch the electronic shutter for the rest of the ceremony yeah. because it's just totally silent. What a great tip, though! I never thought of doing that. A, a quick burst, and then you'll see whether it's mm-hmm. got that flicker. Mm-hmm. Then you can make an informed decision off the back of that. Yeah, yeah, great idea. Thank you very much for your question. If you are sending your questions in, then the email address is click at fujicast.co.uk. Click at fujicast.co.uk. Right, this we, oh, we, we haven't done our, um, I tell you what we haven't done yet, which we should do, our thanks. We haven't done our, before we do the question, uh, before we do the topic rather, let's get our, um, our reviews out because we haven't done our, uh, our, our, our self-indulgent minute. Uh-huh. It's going to be yours first. Away you go. Okay, great listen. Keep up the good work, chaps. A recommended listen, whether you shoot Fuji or not. Alistair Freeman. We mentioned him. <laughs> Funny enough. Good old Alistair. We like Alistair. Oh, thank you, Al. 
Um, Phil Peak, I just wanted to say what a most excellent podcast you've both created. Uh, great content, informative, properly interesting. Your style is unaffected, honest, and makes makes oi laugh. <laughs> makes oi laugh. Makes oi laugh. Oh, so you're you're talking in Cumbrian. Keep it up. Look forward to hearing more. I usually listen on my long commute of the M6 in Cumbria. That is a long commute. Thank you very much, Boise. <laughs> Murray McMillan uh, this podcast is great I'd never ever listened to one before and this has got me into the genre oh, so much to podcast. two great presenters and two uh, such great topics and chat really entertaining whether you shoot Fuji or not one of my highlights of the week when a new episode is on brilliant thanks Mark, Murray Mark Zilberman from New York going by the email Ooh, at Nadia. I know Mark do you? yeah hi okay, Kev Neil show is just great thankfully not just you excuse me not just useful for Fuji owners I don't know where you guys get the time <laughs> oh. I know Mark really well. How do you know Mark? Um, I met him in uh, New York, and uh, he's a uh, he's he's a documentary he's a, wedding he's photographer. He's a good guy. He, yeah, he's a, he's a really good guy. A really really nice guy. Actually. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And if you'd like to leave those reviews, then obviously um, you know you need to leave reviews that are truthful and authentic. Um, but we do like to read out the ones that <laughs> that are particularly nice, and we'll get round to them all. I think. Yeah. We'll do our best. Topic of the week. Just a, a, a shortish one this week. Um, uh, getting in close to your subject. Um, if you like, in the old-fashioned language, 24 mil, something like that, or 16 mil in Fujifilm language. I, I, I particularly like to, to, to get in close. I think in terms of shooting weddings, um, the best storytelling comes from, from when, you're, when you're close. And I think if you, if you back off across a room with, um, with a long lens, nothing makes people feel more uncomfortable or, or more like they are being. I hate that phrase, papped. Oh, you pat me, mate. No, no. Um, then, then something like a fifty to one forty, um, mm. or what would have been seventy to two hundred. I think if you're across a room with a long lens, then uh, that that can make people feel intensely uncomfortable. I think if you're part of the party, if you're close to the party, if you're with the party, mm. then people are more likely to let you into that party. Yeah, I agree. And uh, there's a couple of elements of this that that probably need discussing from my point of view i suppose is that i really really uh, you know i like to deliver images that are from a guest's eye point of view yeah rather than from a photographer's point of view yeah. i want to deliver images that the guests have seen right um but on the same time you don't really want to kind of affect those moments and affect those scenes so that's why uh, changing when i changed all those years ago when the x100 came along I didn't know that what I was looking for. I didn't know I wanted a new camera. And nothing, it was just, you know, I just bought this new camera. I wasn't in the market for changing systems. But but what happened was I was getting in closer. I knew I could see the images. They were they, I was getting in much closer, and I was getting more intimate pictures. But crucially, I wasn't getting in the way. I wasn't affecting moments. Do you feel that People a weren't changing. the size of camera would have made that difference? Yeah. You'd, you'd have, you know, even with a you, – you were a 5D user, weren't you? I, or were you 1D? I had a 1D Mark IV, remember? Okay. So – which was a fantastic camera. Yeah. But my word, it was huge, absolutely huge. And, and the clatter with the shutter as well. Yeah, the clatter. Clack, 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 clack. It, it, it was just, you know, but don't get me wrong. I, I didn't know that I wanted something different until X100 came out. But when it did, and I was getting these images that were much, just much more intimate, much closer. But at the same time, not kind of damaging the environment, not 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 destroying the moments. Um, because, of course, you know, it, it would be wrong for either of us to say you can't get in close and personal with a DSLR mm. because that's just not true, especially now because they're smaller. Yeah. But in those days, you could still get exactly the same types of pictures. But there was no way that you would be able to do that and not have some kind of impact on the moment. Now, uh, especially with the X100 and, and the X-Pro2, you could shoot one-handed if you will. I'll often wander around the drinks yeah, reception yeah. with an X100 in one hand and a glass of orange juice or something in the other. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. You know, uh, yeah. and, um, and and just, you know, just click away inside, right inside the, the, the wedding, and you just get those really close-up pictures without the threat of... Um, of people worrying about it, I like the um, ten to twenty four. Now you don't use the ten twenty four photographing of weddings at all, do you? No. But for me, and I know we talked about this a couple of weeks ago in the kitchens when I'm photographing chefs at work. Mm. I think that ten twenty four because everything's distorted, like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like whatever on the outsides of the frame. 
but that that just for me just that that i love that that uh-huh. distortion on the edge the chef that i work with quite uh, quite a uh, one chef i work with quite regularly at a wedding venue calls them uh, he's um, up the nose shots his yeah. na- nasal hair shots yeah, yeah, he yeah. particularly dislikes that angle yeah but it does it does i just think that urgency that it gives when you're right in there and you can see the hand stretching out bringing you food across the pass yeah and all that kind of stuff i think is wonderful i think the closer you can get to a subject the better i always remember i i it, it, we have signature images in your career don't you mm. and for me one of my favorite signature images without a shadow of a doubt uh, well, there's a couple, but one in particular is of um, a lady that um, a, a slightly older lady, more mature lady, a hmm. mother who is crying, and her daughter reaches out and cups her mother, um, her mother's cheek in her hand, and um, it was um, it was a story where the, the bride's father had passed away not too long before the actual wedding. And uh, he was Italian, mum was Italian, and when the bride came out and she went to mum and she was speaking, I don't speak Italian, but it doesn't take a brain surgeon to work out, they were talking about papa. Uh-huh. And um, I, I thought, right, I, I, I want to get this, but I want to be that point of view look. So I, I was essentially over the bride's shoulder um, with a what would have been for me at the time, 24 millimeter lens, uh-huh. got the picture, then came away very quickly again because what I what, what I think you know working close is one thing but then you should never encroach too much beyond that. No, yeah, absolutely. Get, get your picture, make your picture, move out. Yeah, I think we mentioned this last week so as I well. Do, <laughs> just just firing off shutter after shutter after shutter after shutter. I think there's nothing worse than that. No, absolutely, and uh, you know it's especially now if we are using mirrorless cameras where you can see the exposure in the viewfinder yep. there's no real excuse for it and yep. you know you it's really important to me that those moments carry on uh, un, undestroyed by the by the presence of the photographer really important do, do you have a favorite close up moment i have a similar one actually where it was an indian wedding and it was um it was a two day wedding so the the um hindu wedding was on the, the Friday, I believe, mm-hmm. and then the Sikh wedding was on the Saturday, and the Sikh wedding started at something like five a.m. in the morning. So um, I, did, oh, I had to get to Saithal. That's like um, um, the Chinese wedding start really mm. early as well, don't they? So I got to Saithal. I got to this um, uh, Southwold, Saithal, or South in South London. Sorry. Yeah. So I got to the um, to the ceremony location, and um, I'd seen this. The grandmother was at the wedding the previous day, and um, obviously, so was the bride. And, and I could see that there was some kind of relationship between them, but I never managed to capture anything between them the day before. But on this particular day, um, the grandmother came and and did the same thing, cupped the um, the bride's face. She wasn't teary or anything, mm. but it was just one of those moments where. I, because I was aware of the relationship, I was trying to, to to look for something, and I saw them approach each other, and I walked over and I shot it with my X one hundred S. It was back in those, so it's it's probably five six years old. This picture, right? Still one of my favourite ones. Um, and yeah, it's it's you know it's a tender moment. One one picture, that's it. One picture, one frame, and, was one that frame. It? You nailed it. One frame, one frame. Well, you're go a better away. man than me. No, but it was not about nailing it. It's about not not wanting to upset the apple cart. Mm. Um, yeah, you that's know, true. I'd rather have, I'd rather have, you know, got a picture that's not technically perfect yeah. and allowed them to carry on having their moment than, mm. than have an effect on the moment and have a technically perfect picture. So six, so it's twenty three for you because uh-huh. you, you like the the twenty three millimeter length. For me, uh-huh. it's the the sixteen. No, you see, the sixteen for me is just I don't know. It's for me, it just feels a little bit. Well, I do use it occasionally, and uh, as we mentioned, I think last week, the, the sixteen mil f two point eight lens is out now, and that that's mm. a lens that does interest me because mm. I have the sixteen mil one point four. But I just never use it, and maybe it's because of the size. Maybe it's because I'm, I don't know, lazy or whatever. But I feel that the sixteen two point eight, because it's smaller and lighter, might be something that I'll pop on one of the cameras and see how I get on with it. Um, of course, I have to buy it first, which I'll, I'll get around to doing. Um, but the yeah, I technic- t- typically like eighteen. I use occasionally as well these days. I really love the eighteen mil lens. Um, that's one I really hope that Fujifilm will update in the future. I'd love to I've see got them that do 18, that. I've got that 18, yeah. That's such a small lens as well. I keep nice the 18mm the on the uh, my X-T2. Mm. I use the X-T2 only when I go out with the family X-T. I don't tend to use my X-T3s, funny enough, for anything other than professional work and uh, filming. Uh. So if I'm filming or... Yeah, but that's that's the same as me. You see, the the XT range for me are functional cameras. They're not fun cameras, and you know, quite open about this. 
the X Pro X one hundred. Yeah, X70. I wish I'd, I sold both my X Pro twos, and I wish I'd have kept one, just one. Mm. When's the X Pro three coming out then? <laughs> I don't know. Shall we grill Kev on this one? <laughs> When's the X Pro three coming? Uh, honestly, out, I have no idea. I'm not involved Looking in my anything eyes. like that. Do, 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 yeah. do, 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 do. Um, Actually, I don't even know if we'll ever get an X Pro Three. Really? Well, because we've skipped a generation. You know, if you look really? at the order of things, yeah, it didn't. It's it's kind of been left left away. Um, and uh, you know, and I'm kind of half of me is like, what can they make? How can they make the X Pro Two better? Well, you know? yeah, well, I'd like to see an X Pro Three with the guts of the XT Three in it. That's yeah. What I'd well, like maybe, to see. maybe. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Should we move on? Yeah, why not? <laughs> why not? <laughs> okay. Um, well, that's it. That's it for another week. Time, gentlemen, please. Is that it? Yeah. But oh. well, did you want to go on further? No. Oh, did we... Um... Have you got homes to go to? <laughs> Come on, gentlemen. Have you got homes to go to? Didn't we, what have we missed? Uh, no, I think that was it. Yeah. We've got everything. That was okay. Meeting adjourned. Meeting Thank adjourned. you very much. Well done, everybody. Next week. Ladies and gentlemen, come back with biscuits. Mm. That's it for for this week, then. Um, next week on the show, I love the subject that we've got next week. Give it its full title. Gear acquisition syndrome. Have you got gas? I for uh, I was I I've got so much footage for a YouTube film I I've been wanting to make about gas. And um subsequent in that time, funny enough, that the X Pro twos were in that film. Because uh, um I was really favouring the XT twos and yeah. stuff like that. And now you bought more stuff. Well, yeah, yeah. Although I did sell all my Canon gear, so so to be fair, um, you can't accuse me of gas, but in in that respect. But next week we're talking about gas and the, the people that just bought buy and buy and buy and buy and buy. Yeah, buy and buy. yeah. And I include myself in that. Yeah. Well, your camera bags, aren't you? That's your gas mm, problem. Yeah. And actually, of no, well, books, books. Yeah. Mm. That's a good gas thing, though, isn't it? Yeah. When is gas good? When is gas bad? Next week, we'll discuss your gas. If you have any gas-related... <laughs> no, no. Thank you for your questions. Uh, please keep sending them in. Click of fujicast.co.uk. It's really, really special, and I mean that, important to us when you do. It shows that people are connecting with the show, which is, which is fantastic. And, well, it gives us material. Yeah. <laughs> well, if it weren't for those questions, we would, we'd just have to have a little yeah. chat and a cup of coffee every yeah. day. Yeah. Um, Oh, on that note, by the way, do tell us if you'd like to do a little walk around. We we mentioned that, didn't uh, we? Yeah, Brighton. Let's a Bright- do Brighton. A Brighton walk around. Yeah. Who is up for a Brighton walk around? Email us, please, and uh, click at fujicast.co.uk. I think we need to. We'll we need to. We, yeah, and I, it's, I would say it needs to be something like mm, June ish. Mid-week. It needs to be warmer, doesn't it? It needs to be midweek. Yeah, midweek in June. Yeah, let's let's do something like that. And you have if we to... get enough emails, we'll we'll pick a date. Yeah, and you have to like fish and chips. Correct. And you have to like pint. Yes. And you have to be prepared to buy Kev. Um, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about that. Right. Payoff this week. Are we, have you got Al- Albi yet? Has he done no. his payoff yet? He's terrified. Oh, Albi, we need your. Payoff. I might get Gemma to do it. Yeah, definitely. In the She'll meantime, it's swear. <laughs> <laughs> in the meantime it's Rosa who won't be swearing my dad's Instagram is Kevin Mullins Photography see his films on YouTube at Documentary Eye his website is kevinmullinsphotography.co.uk or for street workshops training and everything Fujifilm go to f16.click and for me it's Thomas my dad's Instagram is Neil James see his films on YouTube at Neil James Photo his website is neiljames.com for pictures and and one-to-one mentoring and you can hear his other photography podcast which is called breathe pictures wherever you get your podcasts oh and don't forget his name is spelled n-e-a-l-e thank you as well for the love you spread in the apple podcast reviews for our self-indulgent moment and thank you to simpler straps um, because if you write in and it's a question of the week or a thought of the week then we're going to send you a simpler strap Simple you've still not that. chosen the red one have you yeah we must send that to um it's going i'll sort it out uh, yeah see you next week bye-bye bye-bye